ಬಯೋಲಾಜಿಕಲ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಈಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ <laughs> we can't know from the virus <laughs> <laughs> oh my god don't don't remind me virus yes, people are my day taking good. over the virus everywhere <laughs> yeah what to do okay let me mute Rashmi my madam I, good afternoon sir good afternoon madam i think he will join another can actually he came we joined and left that because we want some time to prepare that so we'll back in 10 minutes sir how are you all sir how are you ma'am you tell we are at least in the campus <laughs> sir you are safe sir <laughs> <laughs> yeah you are right. in the cosmopolitan metros yeah yes we sir be more careful yes sir we are surrounded by uh, uh, 100 people uh, uh, 100 active cases <laughs> so oh, it's it's really it's a it's a society of 1500 uh, flats so everywhere uh, every building has at least 10 cases mm-hmm. so yeah i think now we have to live with it okay oh madam uh, good afternoon you are in the yeah good afternoon sir sir i can't hear you you are in the hyderabad yes sir i actually had this faculty induction program so oh, uh, so for that i got this od and i came here and then i'm stuck <laughs> <laughs> i think you would have uh, you would have like to stay in the campus rather than the hyderabad <laughs> yes sir yes sir. actually uh, my father in law is old so i see him panicking every day then i think i could have gone to gulbarga now that it's locked down so madam uh, yeah yes sir madam, it started youtube live okay okay, okay sir so <laughs> let's mute speak okay, okay sir yeah but uh, not can to the person it just started just now So Dr. Durai, Honorable Vice Chancellor and Richard are going to join or uh, it's a kind of official program, right? Hello? Rav, yes sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, They will join at 12.50. Yes. Okay. 10 minutes. Okay. We'll see whether we can have a meeting or else uh, after the talk we can have a meeting. Fine, fine. What is the time difference between uh, us and uh, the speaker? Now it's four and a half hours, sir. Oh, it's four and a half hours. Okay. For Every six minutes. months time changes, sir. Four and a half hours, four and a half hours. Of course, based on cities, sir. They have three, four uh, time zones. Yeah, I understand. Like, you know, like Russia and the... Uh, yeah. So, I think for him it's eight o'clock now. It's eight, ten. No, evening. Now it's a five o'clock. Oh, for them, it's they are ahead of us, right? They are from Japan. <laughs> and evening, you know, evening. Yes, yes, yes. Right. It is like yeah. For them, it's now it's coming in the evening chai time for him. Yes. Okay. Venkat sir, can you check that YouTube? I I put a link here in the chat box. Okay. You try whether that. Uh, link work from your end i put it in the chat box 
because this zoom can accommodate only 100 so we can see the first page sir the introductory page the first page of the speaker i mean the invitation that you prepared okay on youtube only that that much I have seen something distinguished lecture series by Professor. Oh, oh the link is changed, huh? Link. Maybe I'll share the link. In. I'll share the link in Sir, please edit, sir. Everything is there, what we spoke. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to edit, madam. I will, after the meeting, I will edit it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Same link, is it working? No, you have shared in this chat. No, that link is working. Okay, this, this link uh, the, is your. I have to check maybe you can part. share this in this uh, CUK lecture series. Yeah, why that link doesn't work? I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll try that. Oh, actually, this one is like one. No problem. So can you hear me? Mangalam sir, welcome. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. Can you hear me? Thank you, sir. Am I yes, audible? Sir. Yes, sir. You are very audible, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I'm trying to work out this YouTube issue.
Namaskar. You can mute your video. Audio is fine. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Good afternoon, Hi, yes. sir. Welcome back. Good afternoon. Hi there, Jurai. Hi there. How are you? I was going to try and uh, share my screen yes. again. Yeah, you can. Just to make sure uh, that I think everything the first, you, can, you can put the first front page. Yeah, the first page you can display. Okay. Uh, what's this? It says host to save. Yeah, I will, I will, I will, I will make you. Hang on, hang on. Uh, yes. Do you right? Yeah, now you can try this. Yeah. Now? now you can load your presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there it is. Uh, yes. And so, here, okay, I'll just, there we are. And point up. There we go, laser pointer, there we go. Very good. Is that okay? You're right? Is it okay? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's looking good, it's looking good. Okay, very yes, good. Yes, yes, perfectly good. fine. So, anyway, we'll start in another few minutes. Oh, uh, what's happened here? It doesn't see what you are screen sharing. It's, it's not working. Hang on. Uh, no, I could see. Yes, yes, but now, mm. ah, here we go. Okay, now it's working. Okay, back to the front screen. Okay. All right, no worries at all.
yes uh, uh, sir welcome professor basavaraj donor sir our registrar of university i think the vice chancellor will join soon we'll just send a message aha uh -huh. okay I'll make you as a co-host, you as well. Sure, Doc. மங்களம் மங்களம் சார் Shall we start? Join for a meeting, sir. Yeah, can we start? Shall we start? I'm ready to start if if needed. One second. Yeah. Dr. Durai, sir, can we start? it's still early uh, uh, yeah yeah we'll wait for another 5 minutes exactly uh, okay yes. fine fine i'll we'll just, we'll just go and get a drink of water yes yes
Wait for another five minutes. Our vice chancellor is finding difficulty in loading the Zoom in his computer. Someone is having trouble. Yeah, our uh, honorable vice chancellor is trying to load Zoom in his computer. Oh my so goodness! It's taking time. So, oh boy. Sharp, sharp after five minutes. Oh boy. I think Professor Alawadi has joined. Hello, sir. Hello, Dr. Dorek. Fine, sir. We'll just wait for you to join. Honorable Vice Chancellor joined, I think, there, sir. He just spoke. Yeah. Just to confirm once. Hello. Yep. Hello. Sir, you're audible. You're audible, sir. You're audible. Sir. I'm audible, no? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Sorry for the little delay of three minutes. So we can start the meeting. Okay. So welcome you all. Now I would like to call Dr. Mangalam to welcome you all formally and give a brief just about the history of the distinguished series which happened in our university. Dr. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Durai Pandi. Uh, a very good afternoon to all uh, the participants who have joined us. A very good afternoon to our Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor M. V. Alagwadi. A very good afternoon to our uh, Honorable Registrar, Professor Basar Raj P. Noor. A very good afternoon to our Honorable uh, Speaker, Distinguished Speaker of the Day, Professor Des R. Richardson, my colleague Dr. Durai Pandey will be formally uh, welcoming and introducing the speaker moments later. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, talk a little about this initiative uh, called Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, which we are all becoming part of today uh, through this talk. Uh, and it is my pleasure and privilege to be associated with the same. Uh, and uh, and to be talking in brief about uh, 
this platform. This platform was envisioned and initiated at Central University of Karnataka uh, with the mission of uh, disseminating knowledge and uh, moreover working as a bridge between uh, the CUK community, particularly CUK students and uh, distinguished scholars uh, from India and abroad who have, uh, uh, who have brought in uh, innovation, critical thinking and changes at a global scale. Uh, so this platform has been envisioned to facilitate this uh, interaction and dialogue between CUK community and uh, distinguished lectures from all over the world. And with this mission, uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series uh, was initiated in the year 2014, January 2014. And ever since then, uh, quite a few uh, lectures have been organized. Uh, and the credit goes to the founding members of the committee who, uh, under the stewardship of the then Vice Chancellor Professor S.S. Uh, Murthy, became, uh, have initiated and have facilitated uh, these uh, distinguished lectures. Uh, and successive vice chancellors, Professor MNS Rao, Professor H.M. Mahiswaraya, and now our honorable vice chancellor, Professor M.B. Alagwadi, have given continuous support and impetus to this initiative. Uh, so far, uh, under the banner, 12 lectures have been organized, and it is important to have a quick glance over these lectures to appreciate this incredibly enriching insights on a wide ranging themes uh, afforded uh, by our distinguished uh, speakers all over these years, uh, which have, which have benefited, benefited uh, our CUK community immensely in uh, its academic development uh, so far. So some of these lectures I'm going to just briefly uh, mention. The first of the lectures was given by uh, Professor V.S. Raju, uh, former director of IIT Delhi, and he gave his talk uh, on 29th January 2014 on a very important uh, topic. You have the potential in you to become an excellent uh, lead teacher. Uh, then the next talk was given by Professor Rajan Gurukal, former Vice Chancellor, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala, in uh, 2014 itself on 27th November. And the topic of his talk was, I quote, quality education, challenges and possibilities, quote ends. Uh, then the third of the lectures was given by Professor P. Balaram, former director, Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru, and uh, in the year 2015, and the title of his talk was, I quote, uh, Science, Medicine and Law, the Story of the Anti-Cancer Drug Glevic. So in some way, our talk today is uh, uh, probably going to be uh, also related. Uh, and the next talk was given by a very renowned speaker, Professor Yogen Rayado, Center for the Study of Developing Societies, New Delhi, uh, in the year 2015. And the title of his talk was, I quote, uh, the role of youth in Indian democracy. Then the next talk was given by uh, Nadoja Dr. Patil Putappa, writer and journalist, an eminent writer and journalist in the year 2015. And the title of his talk was Leadership Quality and Indian Youth. Uh, then another very distinguished lecture was given by uh, Professor Robert Henning, University of Cambridge in the year 2015. And the title of his talk was Geographical Health Information Systems. Then continuing with this legacy, uh, Professor Monica Zinn, uh, uh, who works at Institute of Indology and Tibetology, delivered a talk on man in the well, uh, probable in Buddhist, Jain, and Hindu sources in the year 2015. And uh, then in the year 2016, Professor Gabor Tirolev, uh, delivered a talk on, I quote, what can India learn and unlearn from the Nordic countries to promote a society for all. Following this, uh, the next talk was given by Professor T. Venkates, 
Professor of Emeritus in Biochemistry at St. John's Medical College, Bangalore in the year 2016. And the topic of his talk was Lead in Global Warming, Climate Change and Personal Health. Then uh, another very important distinguished lecture was given by Professor Anand Teltumbre, uh, Vinod Gupta School of Management, IIT Kharagpur in the year 2016 on the title, I quote, Social Justice and Dalit Students in Higher Education. So uh, just looking at these uh, lectures gives us this, uh, uh, this, this uh, perspective about how enriching and how wide ranging these talks have been. And our talk of the day today is surely going to add another feather to this legacy of distinguished lecture series with this I now invite our professor, our honorable vice chancellor, professor M. D. Alagwadi, to talk briefly about our university, Central <laughs> University of Karnataka, <laughs> Kalabadi. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Professor Alagwadi, Honorable Vice Chancellor, can speak few words about our university. Sir, you are audible. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes, sir, you are audible. Just turn on the video. Yeah. Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Yeah. You can speak now. You want me to speak now? Because it got disconnected. Yes, I don't yes, know. Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, we want to introduce our about our university. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, good afternoon. I think uh, it's a good evening. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, Professor Des or Richardson, according to Australian time. Uh, welcome to this distinguished lecture series. Uh, we are uh, really proud and happy to have you on our distinguished lecture series. And I, I went to your uh, vice chancellor uh, Bolga. I, I I was really impressed by your CV and your achievements, your research, and your discoveries in uh, treating cancer. As we all know that uh, cancer is the uh, uh, second uh, single largest disease uh, globally, inflicting a heavy toll on the humanity. So we need a very good. Uh, uh, drugs, very good treatment procedures, very good uh, pre and post uh, cancer treatment. And uh, today we are looking forward to you. I think it got disconnected. Sir, we are not audible, please. in your journey to discover uh, uh, cancer uh, related drugs. I thank profusely on behalf of the Central of Karnataka and its uh, all stakeholders. Thank you once again. I'll be looking forward to hear your uh, uh, speech. Thank you. May I now invite our colleague, uh, Dr. Durai Pandi to formally welcome and introduce the speaker and take over the proceedings further. Uh, Dr. Durai Pandit, over to you, sir. Okay. Yes. 
thank you dr mangalam uh, professor mp alawadi honorable vice chancellor of our university for their address actually this yeah you you invite my, dr des richardson to address yeah, yes yes so in fact it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce professor des richardson in fact i have introduced few people in the past in some seminars but this is going to be very 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 difficult because i have gone through the cv of professor richardson which is about 200 Invite, pages uh, professor richardson to address so yes sir after the introduction we will so professor richardson is cv is 200 pages so i will try to give very short very very short introduction about him in fact des has received his masters and phd as well as doctor of science from the university of western australia subsequently he moved to mcgill university canada for his post doctoral studies and he continued there as assistant professor for few years until he returned to australia to take up a position of lecturer since 2005 he has been working as a full professor and of course he is a fellow of royal college of pathologist uk and also fellow of faculty of sciences by royal college of pathology australasia and professor des has published more than 450 research articles in the acclaimed journals that include lancet for cell uh, and different internet connection in university ens blood etc webex they should have gone for webex okay i think all over is a script uh because i have seen the audience from the other science background if you want for example the impact factor of lancet is about 60 okay so he published such uh, high quality papers in the journals and also his papers received more than 40000 citations credited him the h index of ufing 97 and he also had 20 international patents in his credit and professor des has received more than 7 million dollar research grant for his research from all over the world if you could translate into indian rupees it would turns to be more than 350 crores okay it this is apart from his instrument and instrument in infrastructure grant and of course he is a member of about 25 international societies he has been serving and served as editor and editorial board member of 47 international chemistry and biology journals Professor Des has supervised 65 PhDs and has trained over 60 postdocs in his career. Of course, he uh, guided both undergraduate and postgraduate students as well. And he received, in fact, numerous awards to name it. I just want to mention one here. He recently he received the Vice Chancellor Award for excellence in research from the Australian government. in fact he has presented more nearly 1000 invited lectures all over the world he worked in various places in australia initially in university of queensland and then university of new south wales later at the university of sydney currently he hold a position of alan mckesson a distinguished professor at griffith university brisbane australia in fact he is the first chair in the 45 years history of the griffith university and he is also adjunct and visiting professor in different universities all over the world particularly in canada china czech republic as well as in japan his research group actively working on various diseases like cancer alzheimers friedreich ataxia and iron overload diseases recently he started working on other neuro degeneracies as well and his research group contain mixed of people from chemistry biology pathology and animal biologist to develop a better drug to treat these diseases and in fact one of the chemical compound patent 
patented by him recently entered into multi center clinical trials for treating advanced and resistant cancer i believe that this is going to show his successful story of find making better drug for the cancer through his research findings under the title innovative anti cancer agents that inhibit metastasis resistance and primary tumor with this little long introduction i welcome professor des to take over the platform to deliver the distinguished lecture professor des okay thank you very much jirai thank you for the very uh, nice uh, introduction really do appreciate it and thank you uh, for the invitation today to come and speak so i'd like to tell you really about my career um, in terms of what i've been doing to try and develop innovative anti cancer agents which have this property of overcoming uh, what we call the triad of death in cancer which is composed of three axes which is metastasis which is the spread of the cancers resistance particularly p like a protein mediated resistance and primary tumor growth so these three factors are the main things that actually kill cancer patients so our uh, work has been primarily to try and develop a compound which actually has an effect on all of these various aspects which are very important um, in cancer so um, if i can now move to the Uh, the first slide um durai i'm not sure if you need to enable something because my yeah, slides are I, not I, moving I, oh okay, okay ah thank you very much thank you yeah. so um recently over the last uh five years or so we've been successful in having one of these compounds actually commercialized um with a, an american company called cthulhu ventures and this has resulted in two spin-off companies called Oncochel Therapeutics uh, LLC which is the American company and Oncochel Therapeutics PTY Limited so these two companies were founded to actually take our drug into clinical trials and this is uh, has occurred um the drug which went into clinical trials is called DPC the structure of DPC uh, is presented here it's a small molecular weight compound quite lipophilic quite membrane permeable and so this particular drug actually went into an open label dose finding and pharmacokinetic phase 1 clinical trial uh in advanced cancer patients so these were patients which had uh very very advanced cancers which have been treated over and over with a, a variety of different types of anti cancer agents so the particular trial actually looked at dpc given orally DPC is an interesting compound it can be actually delivered by the oral route in the form of a tablet but it can also be um injected intravenously and what the uh, investigators were able to demonstrate was that the compound showed very good absorption from the gut which is actually uh, important of course for giving a compound via as a tablet and appropriate pharmacokinetics so the compound uh had a half life in humans of around about 18 hours which is actually quite appropriate and quite good and this was pretty similar to what we actually found in the rats in the rats we found the compound had a half life of around about uh 10 hours so these are very interesting compounds and i'd like to tell you the story of actually how we developed them and why we developed them um so basically these compounds uh have a very different mechanism of action we were after a compound which showed a very different effect a very different mechanism of actually killing cancer cells and so we were interested in designing compounds which actually could bind iron and copper now iron and copper are really very very important nutrients which uh, cancer cells uh, require for growth and division um and you may say well okay that's interesting but you know how do you actually get selectivity against the normal cells well cancer cells they take up far more iron and far more copper than normal cells because they're more rapidly growing and in fact if you look at the cancer cells in sections and compare them to the the normal cells what you find is that the cancer cells express very very high levels of molecules such as the transferrin receptor which takes up iron into the cell but also uh copper transporters 
the, the, the cancer cells require a lot of iron, a lot of copper for very basic processes. And one of these very important processes is DNA synthesis. DNA uh, synthesis is essential for the replication of the cancer cells. And there's a very important enzyme, it's an iron containing enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase, which catalyzes the rate limiting step in DNA synthesis. So if you can target this step and prevent the generation of DNA, you're going a long way to killing the cancer cell. And indeed, these compounds induce apoptosis and cell death by binding iron. So they're not cytostatic, they are actually killing the cancer cells. Now, a very, another very important aspect in terms of the way these compounds uh, act is their ability to actually upregulate a very important molecule, which I'll talk about in some degree today, called um, NDRG1. NDRG1 is a metastasis suppressor. Um, it actually blocks the spread of the cancer cells. And this is really very important because the spread of the cancer cells is what kills most patients. And this is something very, very unique about these compounds that they can actually specifically block metastasis. In fact, this is the only compound that can actually upregulate NDRG1 that's known, this very, very important molecule. So it's a very different way of actually killing cancer cells. So um, I thought I'd just show you uh, a couple of the structures of these compounds. This was our first lead compound. I'll talk about this compound quite a bit as we go through the talk. It's called DP44-MeThT. Um, it's a small molecular weight molecule. As I mentioned, these compounds bind iron, they bind copper, and they have three teeth to do this. So they have this pyridyl nitrogen here, this imi nitrogen, and this thiocarbonyl sulfur. So these three teeth are used to bind the iron and the copper, which are essential for growth and proliferation. Now, these particular compounds are interesting because they do something quite unique. Not only do they bind the iron and the copper, which are needed for growth of the cancer cells, but once they've actually come into the cancer cells and once they've actually bound the iron and the copper within the cancer cells, they then redox cycle to generate free radical species. And this then kills the cancer cell. And we call this the double punch mechanism. The first punch is binding the iron and the copper, which needed for growth. The second punch is this generation of free radicals. And I'll show you a picture, a schematic of the double punch in just a second. But I'd just like to let you know, this is work which goes back to around about 2004. So what I'm gonna be telling you about today is compounds which have been developed over a very, very long period of time. This is not something which we've uh, come up with in the last couple of weeks or the last couple of months. This is something which has been developing over a very, very long period of time. The compounds demonstrated very, very good activity in vitro and cell culture. They were killing the cancer cells very effectively at very low uh, concentrations, 0.06 of a micromolar, relative to when we looked at normal cells, a whole variety of different normal cells, not just fibroblasts. Uh, when we looked at the fibroblasts, it took up to 25 micromolar of the compound to demonstrate antiproliferative activity. So we're seeing a very, very big difference here. You only need very low amounts of the compound to actually kill the cancer cells, whereas the normal cells, it takes a, a heck of a lot more uh, compound to actually inhibit uh, the growth. So we've got selectivity, which is really important and something that you want in terms of designing an anti-cancer agent. Now, this is just a schematic of this uh, double punch mechanism. Here we have the compound. Um, here, it's called the dp 44 ft um, As I've mentioned before, it's very lipophilic. It satisfies all of the, the properties of Lipinski. So it can actually come into cancer cells very, very quickly where it binds the iron or the copper within the cancer cells and forms a complex. And so what you can see, this is an, an iron complex with one chelator wrapped around the iron uh, over this side, and then another, comp another compound, another ligand wrapped around the iron on the other side. And so what you get is a complete coordination shell. Now, this is the first step in the double punch, the binding of the iron or the copper, which prevents the cells from using the iron and the copper for growth. Then what you get is these compounds then generate free radical species. So they uh, actually, what happens is the, the, the binding sites create an appropriate microenvironment, an appropriate redox potential to be actually be reduced 
by intracellular reductants such as NADH or FADH, and you get the generation of iron two or copper one complexes, and then they interact with oxygen to generate the free radicals, which then go on to kill the cancer cells. So this is a very unique way of actually killing the cancer cells. Now, one of the aspects which I already discussed very briefly is the ability of these compounds to actually overcome this triad of death. And this is just a, um, a slide just demonstrating the triad of death here, composed of these three axes, tumor growth, primary tumor growth, metastasis, the spread of the cancer, and drug resistance. So in, in order to actually uh, effectively inhibit the growth of cancer, you need to go after each of these axes. Um, and the very interesting aspect of these compounds is, is that they, need, they actually have multiple molecular targets, which enables this to occur. So in terms of inhibiting metastasis, these compounds upregulate this protein NDRG1, this metastasis suppressor, which blocks the, the spread of the cancer cells. And I'll show you some data in just the next couple of slides, just demonstrating how effective they are at blocking the spread. Then these compounds also affect other molecular targets in the cell to block primary tumor growth. So for instance, they can upregulate tumor suppressors such as P53 to actually block cell cycle progression and a variety of other processes. And finally, another aspect which I'm gonna talk about today in quite a lot of detail is the ability of these compounds to work by a very unique mechanism to overcome p glycoprotein protein-mediated drug resistance by actually being transported by a, a pump called p glycoprotein, which is a very important molecule which actually imparts resistance on the cancer cells. And again, resistance is really important in terms of um, uh, the, 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 the pathogenesis of the cancer. So how good are these compounds? Well, this is some studies uh, in vitro using uh, nude mice. And so what we've done here, we've taken these animals and we've injected them subcutaneously with a tumor. We've allowed the tumor cells to actually grow and divide, which occurs over about a week or two. Um, and we allow that tumor to grow to around about 100 millimeters cubed. Um, and then once we have the primary tumor, they, we then begin uh, tail, veil in, vein, tail vein injections to actually test the systemic effect of these compounds on the growth of the primary tumor in the mice. And this is actually a melanoma. This was one of the first uh, tumors which we were looking at. We chose melanoma because we were interested in trying to develop a compound for highly resistant solid tumors. We weren't interested in tumors which were very susceptible. We were after the tumors which don't respond very well to current chemotherapies. And so melanoma was a good choice. And what you can see is uh, here, some studies, uh, after five to six weeks of treatment, you can see that our first compound, our first lead compound called dp 4 form ft has very markedly decreased the growth of these melanoma tumors. So this was really very exciting in terms of their activity. We then went on to look at a whole variety of other types of uh, tumor xenografts in the mice. And this was basically important because we were after a compound which would be acting like something like a penicillin, having an effect on a whole variety of different kinds of cancers. And indeed, this is some studies looking at uh, lung cancer. Again, it's using the uh, in vivo nude mouse model. And so this is a lung carcinoma. This is the uh, control tumors. They grow very well in mice. Uh, but after treatment with DP4 form FT, and this is intravenous therapy, by the way, after only 12 to 14 days, you can see the very marked inhibition of growth uh, induced by this compound. We then looked at ovarian carcinoma cells, another very common tumor. Again, we see a nice inhibition of growth. This is a neuroepithelioma. So again, the compound was showing good activity at blocking growth over very short periods of uh, treatment, over 10 to 12 days of treatment. And again, this is the melanoma. So this was very encouraging studies uh, for us very early on in the process in terms of trying to develop these compounds. And so we went on to do uh, far more extensive studies. This is um, another tumor. This is looking at pancreatic cancer. Again, we looked at a very aggressive tumor. This has about a 95% death rate. And so a very, very difficult to treat cancer. And this is studies done over a much longer period of time, up to 42 days. You can see the growth of the tumor is very, very uh, quick. 
uh, and very avid in these animals. So we get a very uh, large tumor quite uh, quickly. Uh, you can see that um, we've also here uh, assessed our drugs relative to a standard chemotherapy, which is called gemcitabine. Gemcitabine has quite a good effect at blocking the growth of the tumor. It had about the same effect as our first lead compound, our first generation compound called DP44MFT. So uh, DP44MFT and gemcitabine, pretty similar activity. However, the important thing here was a second generation compound, which was called DPC. DPC totally blocked the growth of the tumor. So this was very exciting for us. You can see the very marked effect of DPC here relative to the control and relative to the standard chemotherapy gemcitabine. Now, another very important aspect was that the compound uh, inhibited the growth of the tumor without having a marked effect on the weight of the animal. Now, this is important. Uh, if an animal, if you give an animal an anti-cancer drug and it begins to lose weight, you know that the compound isn't well tolerated. But in this case, the compound was well tolerated over this period, quite a long period of treatment, of intensive treatment, five days a week for up to uh, 42 days. So again, very, very good news. We then went on to look at DPC uh, given orally by a gavage uh, to these animals. And so uh, what we can see here is a study again uh, in the nude mice, but, but this time the, the drug was administered uh, via, via the, the mouth of the animal via gavage. Uh, again, you can see this particular tumor, which is a lung cancer, uh, grows very nicely if you just give the vehicle control but when you administer DPC, DPC totally blocked the growth of the tumor, uh, which was really great without any effect on the, the body weight uh, of the actual animal, which again demonstrates that it was tolerable and no effect on any of the uh, major organs that you can see from the histology. And this is just some uh, photographs of the heart. So uh, the compounds were very uh, tolerable and, and this was also a very exciting result for us. We then looked a little bit more at the toxicology of these compounds and the tolerability just by assessing the effects of um, the weights of the various organs compared to the tumor. Um, and out of all of these organs, which we've examined here over this period of treatment uh, via the oral administration, you can see that the only tissue that's losing weight here is the tumor, which is great. That's exactly what we want. We want to inhibit the growth of the tumor and we don't want to have any effect on the normal organs. So again, selectivity, the compound was showing selectivity. Now, another aspect, which is really quite critical is the fact that these compounds are chelators, they bind iron, they bind copper. And so we were somewhat concerned that we would see hematological effects, that is effects on the blood. Um, because obviously red blood cells need a, a heck of a lot of iron to generate uh, hemoglobin. So we thought to ourselves, well, it's very important to assess the effect of these compounds on the normal hematology of these animals. And what we found was that um, to our great delight, there was absolutely no effect on the red blood cells or actually any of the, the hematological parameters over the period of treatment at the doses which we were giving. So uh, this was quite important. And in fact, it's also was, it was also um, uh, validated when we actually went to the human clinical trials, we also didn't see any effect on the normal hematology in humans. And it's because of the very low dose which you need to actually treat the patients. You only need 10 milligram per kilogram in the mice or 20 milligram per kilogram in the mice, which is really very, very low. And at these doses, you don't get any effects on the normal metabolism of metals, which is really good. So you don't affect the normal hematology. So up to this point, I've shown you uh, the effect of the compounds basically on primary tumor growths on xenografts uh, in uh, using a lot of different uh, adult cancers. We then thought, well, it's also important to look at childhood tumors such as neuroblastoma. Now neuroblastoma is a very, very aggressive childhood cancer. And uh, again, we thought this was a really important tumor to actually demonstrate the activity of our compounds and so again, what we did here, we've actually done a study looking at neuroblastoma tumors um, in the adrenal glands implanted into the adrenal glands of these animals. And you can see that the compound DPC, our second generation compound, 
has actually resulted in a good decrease in the growth of the tumors as well. So we were getting very broad activity of these compounds in a whole variety of different kinds of tumors. And we think that this is probably due to the fact that these compounds are binding iron and copper. Iron and copper are needed for so many different essential processes in the cells. So these compounds have multiple molecular targets. And that's important because cancer is a moving target itself. It keeps changing as it develops. Um, it'll change, it'll uh, alter its molecular targets. So it's important for a drug to actually have a variety of molecular targets so that you can get a good anti-tumor uh, response. So basically what we can see here is that these compounds come into the cells, they bind the iron, and they have a number of different effects. So for instance, they upregulate the uh, protein P21. P21 is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor. It blocks the cell cycle. So this is, a, again, a very good response. There's also a decrease in another protein, which is called cyclin D, cyclin D1, in fact. Cyclin D1 is really important for the progression of the cells through the cell cycle, through the G1 phase of the, the cell cycle. So decreasing cyclin D1 is another very, very good indicator. I mentioned earlier about ribonucleotide reductase. This is the rate-limiting step in DNA synthesis. Again, the ability of these compounds to bind iron prevents the iron from actually being incorporated into this protein and prevents its, um, it prevents its enzymatic, enzymatic activity of reducing ribonucleotides into deoxyribonucleotides, shutting off DNA synthesis. Now, uh, due to the fact that you're shutting off DNA synthesis, this results in a response which results in upregulation of a tumor suppressor protein, which is called P53. It's one of the, what they call the guardian of the genome. And this is a transcription factor which actually can very markedly shut down the cell. And so this upregulation is also very, very important. And finally, we have here this NDRG1, which is something that my laboratory has basically focused on in the last 15 years or more. And we've been able to characterize that this molecule, this NDRG1, is a very effective uh, metastasis suppressor through its ability to actually block a whole variety of different cellular signaling pathways which actually shut down the ability of the tumor to spread. So what you get basically as a, as a, as a subject of this uh, barrage of any cancer activity is a, is a whole variety of responses. So you get a G1S arrest in the cell cycle, you get inhibition of proliferation. Now this is just not cytostasis, this is actually cytotoxic. So you get apoptosis and you get cell death. And not only that, you also get uh, metastasis suppression, which is really very important. Metastasis plays a very, very big role in killing many different patients. So it's important that these compounds can block the metastatic process. And this is just, I thought I'd show you this slide because I think it's very interesting. Um, our work was published, of course, and then subsequently it was independently validated, not once, not twice, but by many different independent investigators uh, throughout the world. And so this is one particular case of independent validation of the activity of our compounds, demonstrating how effective they are at blocking the spread of the cancer. So this is on day zero. This is studies done um, taking uh, nod skid mice and uh, injecting them into the heart with breast cancer cells, which have the propensity to migrate to bone. Now, that's a very nasty aspect of breast cancer pathology, that these cells actually metastasize and then spread to bone and cause all kinds of problems. So what they've done here, they've taken these uh, nasty cancer cells, they've injected them. These cancer cells have a bioluminescent label, so you can see the cells once they've injected them into the heart. The cells are pumped around the body by the heart, and they're, they're, they're spreading throughout the body of the animal. So this is day zero. This is the saline control at the top. And this is after nine days and three injections of saline. And what you can see is, is that the tumors have become localized here, probably into the brains of the, I mean, sorry, into the, 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 the bones of the skull, uh, probably here to the, um, to the rib cage, perhaps into the vertebral column, perhaps here to the pelvis, and again here to the head. So the cancer cells have spread very, very effectively over nine days. Uh, this is the control of the top. We then look at the effect of our compound, our lead compound. And what you can see here is the studies with the animals. Mm -hmm. After the injection of DP44-MFT, 
you can see that the DP44 form FT after only nine days and three injections has almost totally blocked the growth and the spread of the cancers. Compared to the control at the top, you can see just very, very minor uh, tumor growths here. So DP44 form FT, our lead compound has been demonstrated here by a totally independent group in the US to very markedly inhibit the growth of the cancer cells, which was in very, very good agreement with our studies. So one of the things is when you try and develop a new anti-cancer agent is that you wanna try and understand how it actually works in the cancer cells. And so we did this, um, we, we characterized these compounds and their ability to actually um, uh, affect molecular targets and also to affect various organelles within the actual cells. And what I'd like to tell you about is this uh, series of studies demonstrating that our, our drugs love lysosomes. Lysosomes are the organelles in the cells that actually digest proteins and uh, uh, organelles and actually break down proteins and then liberate the nutrients. So it's a very, very important process in the, in the, in the cancer cells, in all cells. The lysosome is known as the garbage man of the cancer cell, of the cancer cell or the normal cell. It cleans up the cell and it helps the cell. Now, uh, the fact that these compounds are actually, the fact that they're actually uh, getting into the lysosome, which is what I'm gonna show you today, um, is actually very, very important in terms of the ability of these compounds to actually overcome drug resistance, which is a huge problem in the clinics where the, uh, the cancer cells become resistant due to the expression of transporters, such as P-glycoprotein, where no longer the standard chemotherapy can kill the cancer cells. So they're resistant to standard chemotherapy. So the fact that these compounds are entering the lysosome, targeting the lysosome is actually really important to understand in terms of understanding how these compounds are working. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about these studies. So the first thing that we were interested in is looking at where these compounds actually go within the cells and how they actually bind the metals. And to bind metals in cells, you can very sensitively assess this using a, a number of different radioisotopes. And classically, we use um, uh, the isotope iron 59 to actually look at the ability of these compounds to bind iron, but also another isotope, which is called copper 64, to look at their ability to bind copper. And to our surprise, when we looked at the ability of our compounds to actually bind the copper in the cancer cells, what we found was that once they bind the copper, they seem to uh, prevent the copper uh, from being released from the cancer cells. And in fact, the copper accumulates with the compound. And so this was quite a, a strange observation that once the compounds come into the cell, they bind the copper and they seem to get stuck in the cell and they seem to accumulate in the cell. And so we started to think, well, what on earth is happening here? Where, where are the compounds actually getting stuck? Where are they actually accumulating? And so we did a cellular fractionation of where all the copper was after the treatment with our compounds. And what we found to our surprise was a lot of the compound, a lot of the copper binding compound was actually found within the lysosomal fraction. And so this was quite a surprise at the time uh, because we didn't, have no, we didn't have no idea that they'd be found in the actual uh, lysosomes. But the lysosomes, as I mentioned previously, they're really very important for the cell. And so they could be a very important molecular target. So we started to think about, well, how are these compounds actually getting stuck in the lysosome? Now, uh, one of the aspects of... Uh, of, of biology is that you, you'll probably understand that the chemistry of the compound will dictate the way it actually works in the cells. So the, the chemistry of the compound dictates its pharmacological effects. And so we started to think about, well, what, what are the chemical properties of these compounds that lead to them being uh, accumulated within the actual lysosomal compartment? So this is a study looking at potentiometric titrations, looking at the charge of the compound as a function of pH. Now that's important because if a, if a compound is, is neutral at uh, uh, the pH of the blood, 
7.4, then the compound will be able to get into the cancer cells very, very effectively. And indeed, when we looked at our compound and looked at its ionization at pH 7.4, which is the pH of the blood or the cytosol within the cells, we found that the compound was totally neutral. It didn't have any charge. So this meant that the compound could get through the membrane very, very nicely at the pH of the blood. Now, the, the, the fact was in the previous slide, I showed you that the compounds were accumulating in the lysosome. The interesting thing about the lysosome is that it's at pH five, which is quite a difference to the pH of the blood. When we looked at the pH five and then looked at the charge on our compound, we found around about 16% of the compound actually had a charge on it at pH five. So we started to think about this. And uh, if you think about it, once the compound has come through the cell, once it's, it's, an, it's in the blood, it's at pH 7.4, it's neutral, it'll come through the, 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 the plasma membrane very, very easily because it is neutral. It'll come into the cytosol, which is also at around pH 7.4. But the moment that it goes into the lysosome, it's going to get a charge on it. It's going to get this charge, which will block the compound from being able to diffuse back out of the lysosome. So basically, it'll come in, get a charge, and then it'll begin to accumulate within the lysosome. So we thought, well, perhaps this explains how these compounds are actually getting stuck in the lysosome. It's due to their charge. So we started to think, okay, well, we're getting this accumulation of the compound within the lysosome. Is it actually affecting the lysosome just because the lysosome is such a critical organelle? And so we looked at this using a, uh, some microscopy, looking at uh, live cell imaging and taking cancer cells. These are the cancer cells here, as you can see. The cancer cells have been labeled in this case with a, a dye, which is called acridine orange. Acridine orange accumulates within the lysosomes. And basically, you can see all of the beautiful lysosomes being labeled here in the control cells. So what we have is lysosomes, all of these little baby orange lysosomes are all very, very beautifully shown here in this, in this particular picture. The interesting thing was when we take these cells and then we incubate them with our compound, which accumulates within the lysosome, what we actually found was, was that the compound uh, targeted the lysosomes and induced uh, uh, these lysosomes to burst. And in fact, you can see a, quite a large reduction in the number of lysosomes here relative to the control. And the other thing which was happening was that um, you were getting uh, bursting of the lysosomes and you could see that actually down the microscope. You could actually see these little lysosomes popping in front of your eyes in the presence of these compounds. So these particular compounds were very active at damaging the lysosome. So we started to think, okay, well, that was with uh, the, the acridine orange. What about other uh, markers of the lysosome? Uh, we thought we'd better check other markers of the lysosome to be absolutely 100% careful. And so we used a couple of different, very specific markers of the lysosome. The lyso tracker red, which stains all of the lysosomes here, this beautiful red. And another one, which is called Pepstartan A Bob Dippy FL conjugate, which also accumulates within the lysosomes. And again, you can see them all here, uh, very beautifully labeled in green. Now, this is using a special microscope, which is called a confocal microscope, which enables you to see if these labels are in the same place. That is, if the lysotracker red is in the lysosome and the pe pepstartan A is in, the, is in the lysosome. If they're in the same place, the red and the green will merge to form yellow. It's just like mixing paints. When you mix red and green, you get yellow. And so what it demonstrates is, is that these two dyes are in exactly the same place. So they're in the lysosome. So this is the control. You can see all the lysosomes beautifully labeled here. You then take these cells and you incubate them with this compound that was bursting the lysosomes. You can see quite clearly that we've lost a lot of these lysosomes after treatment with the compounds. So all of this granularity, which is the the lysosomes has disappeared. Same thing goes here with the, with the green stain. And you can note with this particular stain is that not only have we lost the granularity, but we can see the, the, the actual dye has come out of the lysosomes and it's spread throughout the cytosol of the cell. So what's happened here is the, it, the, the, the compound seemingly has damaged 
the lysosomes and the dye is now leaching out of the lysosome and coming into the cytosol. Now that is a catastrophic event, that damage to the lysosome followed by the leakage of enzymes, proteolytic enzymes out of the lysosome into the cytosol can actually induce apoptosis, which is the cell death, the cancer cell death. And you can actually look at that by examining the cleavage of BID, a, a protein called BID, which is a pro-apoptotic mediator uh, of the apoptosis. And what you can see here, when we look at the, the cells which have been treated with our compound, you can see an increase in the cleavage of BID which is very, very marked in these particular cells. So this was really very interesting. We were getting induction of apoptosis after the, uh, the, the, the damage of the lysosomal membrane. So this was quite interesting. So the next question was, well, okay, we've got the compound accumulating in the lysosome, we've got the compound damaging the lysosome, but how is it actually doing that? Now you'll remember that these compounds have this mechanism of being able to bind metals and become redox active, particularly iron and copper. And so we started to think, well, perhaps these compounds are coming into the lysosome, binding copper and iron in the lysosome, and then generating free radicals to actually kill uh, the cancer cell. And so what we can see here is a study done to look at whether these compounds were actually inducing the generation of free radicals. This is in the test tube. And so we're looking here at taking uh, the compounds, adding them to a test tube, and then assessing uh, what we call DCF fluorescence. DCF is a, a compound which becomes fluorescent after it interacts with free radical species. And so what we've done here, we've taken the compound, we've added it to the DCF, and then we've added various metals to the compound. When we added the copper to the compound, there was a huge flux of radicals or free radicals. And so we got a huge increase in DCF fluorescence. And this was really very, very uh, marked after copper and far, far less than what we see after iron. So this seemed to be a copper binding effect uh, that we were actually witnessing here. So we started to think, well, maybe it's the ability to bind the copper in the lysosomes to actually result then in the generation of free radicals which are damaging the lysosome. So we started to think, well, let's have a look at this uh, to see if this is true. And so what we did, we took the cells and the tumor cells and we incubated them with various concentrations of the compound in the presence and absence of agents which can actually um, uh, remove free radical species. So one of these agents is an antioxidant which is called N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine actually mops up free radicals. It prevents free radical damage. And so we were starting to think, well, if we can mop up those radicals, perhaps we can prevent this lysosomal damage. And indeed, when we did these studies, we took the cells, we incubated them with the compound itself. The compound in the red line is very effective. It's blocking the, uh, the growth of the cancer cells very, very effectively. If we take those cells and then we add to them the N-acetylcysteine to increase the levels of glutathione, which mop up the radicals. What we found was is that the compounds uh, became far less cytotoxic. So if you prevent the ability of the compound to generate radicals, you prevented the anti-proliferative activity quite nicely. If you did the opposite, instead of uh, taking away the free radicals, if you could actually enhance the free radicals, what actually you can do, you can take these cells and you can incubate them with a substance called BSO. Now, BSO acts totally opposite to N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine increases the levels of glutathione, this antioxidant in the cells. In contrast, BSO actually inhibits glutathione generation. Now, if you inhibit glutathione generation and you then uh, add this to the cells, what actually happens is, is that our compound becomes far more effective. It can kill these cancer cells far better because now there is no antioxidants to mop up these free radicals. And so our compound can damage the lysosomal membrane far more. We then looked at that using a, the, the microscope again and taking the cells and labeling them again with acridine orange to 
label up all of the beautiful little lysosomes, which you can see all here in orange. We then can take our cells, add the copper compound, the copper DP44MFT, and you can see that the copper complex destroys all of the lysosomes very, very quickly and very, very avidly. But if you take these cells and you add the n acetylcysteine, the agent which blocks, which actually increases the levels of the glutathione in the cells. If you increase the glutathione, you mop up all of the radicals, you prevent the generation of the radicals, you prevent the lysosomal damage, and you save the lysosomes. So uh, by increasing the levels of glutathione, you can prevent the lysosomal damage, demonstrating that the free radical generation is really very, very important in terms of the way these compounds are killing the cancer cells and damaging the lysosomes. So what we have here is a very unique way these compounds work to actually kill cancer cells. They are neutral at pH 7.4, as I told you, which is important for getting into the cancer cells. They can come into the lysosome and the moment they hit the lysosomal pH, what actually happens is they gain a charge. When they get a charge, they can no longer get out of the lysosome and so they accumulate within the actual lysosome. Now, as I mentioned, the lysosome is a really very, very important place in the cell. It recycles proteins, iron-containing proteins, copper-containing proteins, all proteins. When this happens is the proteins are broken down into amino acids. They can then release their bound iron and their bound copper. These compounds, they're in the lysosome, they're ready. They bind the copper and they can begin to redox cycle to generate free radicals. And we could see this in the test tube. We could see that when these compounds bind the copper, uh, they actively generate these free radical species, which are highly toxic, which permeabilize the lysosomal membrane. And we could see in the confocal microscopy, I showed you the confocal uh, microscopy images demonstrating the release of the cathepsins, these proteolytic enzymes out of the lysosome and actually into the cytosol. Now, those cathepsins are very, very important because they're pro-apoptotic um, and they cleave this molecule bid. I showed you the Western, the bid is cleaved, and then you get this pro-apoptotic bid. Bid generates the uh, classical mitochondrial apoptosis, which leads to the release of cytochrome C and cellular death. So this is cytotoxic, as I mentioned before. It's not uh, cytostatic. So we're getting a very, very interesting, very unique way of actually killing cancer cells through the activity of these uh, compounds. And in fact, the fact that these compounds love the lysosome and kill the lysosome was actually very important for understanding how these compounds overcome drug resistance, P-glycoprotein mediated drug resistance. Now drug resistance in cancer is a huge problem in the clinics because what happens is patients are given drugs, standard drugs, the drugs work for six months or so, but then after that, they gain resistance by expressing molecules such as P-glycoprotein. P-glycoprotein is a pump and it pumps drugs out because it's expressed here on the plasma membrane. So drugs such as um, doxorubicin, dox, or vinblastin. When doxorubicin comes into the cell, uh, it actually goes to the nucleus where it uh, actually intercalates into DNA and uh, results in inhibition of topoisomerase. Now, in the presence of cells that have the p-glycoprotein, the dox is basically thrown out of the cell. It's pumped out of the cell and it prevents the compound from killing it the cancer cells. So this is really very, very um, important. This is a very important mechanism by the way cancer cells can actually uh, become resistant to cytotoxic drugs. So we were very interested to see if our drugs, which work by this very unique mechanism, could overcome P-glycoprotein resistance. And so we did some studies looking at uh, this using cells which had become resistant to venblastin. So these are what we call resistant cells they have very high levels of the P-glycoprotein pump. So they're very active at being able to pump out these cytotoxic drugs. And so when you add a drug like vinblastin, this cytotoxic agent, 
it takes an incredible amount of drug to actually kill the cancer cells because the p-glycoprotein just keeps on pumping out the drug. It prevents the toxicity of the cytotoxic drug. So this is the standard picture what you find in many different kinds of cancers, this resistance profile, which prevents the action of the anti-cancer drug. So in contrast to the standard anti-cancer drug, we thought, let's have a look in these same cells at the effect of our compound to see if there was any difference. And what we found was really quite surprising. When we looked at these cells, which had high levels of pig like protein, these cells, these very nasty tumor cells, which can't be killed by the VIN blasted, were actually being killed by our drug. In fact, our drug was far more effective in the p-glycoprotein expressing cells than in the cells that didn't have any p-glycoprotein. So this was really interesting. Somehow, our drug was killing these very, very resistant, very nasty tumor cells. And it appeared that our drug was working better in the presence of the p-glycoprotein. So the big question was, well, how could our drug be doing this? This is really quite amazing that you have a drug which can actually kill these very, very resistant cancer cells. And so we started to think about this and you can look at these kinds of questions using uh, two kinds of cells, that is cancer cells that don't have any p-glycoprotein, which are called KB31 cells. And you compare those to cells which have huge quantities of p-glycoprotein and they're called KBV1 cells. And then you can look at uh, the differences in the way these cells respond. So in the cells without p-glycoprotein, if you add doxorubicin, the doxorubicin works very well. It kills the cancer cells very quickly because what happens is the doxorubicin comes into the cancer cell, goes to the nucleus, kills the cancer cell. There's no p-glycoprotein to pump it out. So it's very, very effective at killing the cancer cells. In contrast, if we look at the cells with p-glycoprotein, what happens is you add the doxorubicin and it takes an incredible amount of doxorubicin to kill these cells. Because what happens is doxorubicin comes into the cancer cell, but immediately it's pumped out again. So it never has a chance to kill the cancer cell. So this is a big problem with this standard anti-cancer therapy. We can do a little bit of a trick here. We can add a p-glycoprotein inhibitor, which is called ALA, Lacrodar. The Lacrodar blocks the pump. If you block the pump, then what happens is no longer will the doxorubicin be shot out of the cancer cell. It can now go to the nucleus and it can kill the cancer cell very, very effectively. So this is something that happens. This has been well known for many, many years, 20 or 30 years. Uh, this is how many drugs become resistant to, uh, the, the many, many cancers become resistant to standard chemotherapy through this particular mechanism involving p-glycoprotein. Now, the big difference here is when we come and use this system, but use our drug. If we use our drug, we see a very different effect relative to the doxorubicin. When we look at our drug in the cells that don't have any p-glycoprotein, our drug isn't working terribly well in the cells that don't have p-glycoprotein. So this suggests immediately that our compound could be using p-glycoprotein somehow to kill these cancer cells. Indeed, when you look at the cells with p-glycoprotein, our drug is working really well. It's killing these cancer cells extremely well. So again, it suggests our drug is using p-glycoprotein to kill these cancer cells. You can then take these cells with p-glycoprotein and you can inhibit the p-glycoprotein using this elacrodar to block the pump. If you block the pump, if you block the ability of this p-glycoprotein to work, we then lose the activity of our special compound. So again, this says that this compound is using p-glycoprotein to kill the cancer cell. So this was really very interesting. We were killing these very resistant cancer cells uh, more effectively by the ability of these compounds seemingly to use p-glycoprotein. But how was this happening? That was the big question. How was it happening? So we started to think, well, maybe, okay, we know that p-glycoprotein is important for the action of our drugs. So maybe somehow uh, p-glycoprotein is transporting our drugs. Maybe this is what it does. It transports drugs. So perhaps it may be P-glycoprotein is transporting our drug. And so we looked at this with a, 
what we call a PGP substrate assay, looking at the ability of pig like a protein to act as an ATPase, to actually burn ATP. And what we found was quite interesting that the, the compound was actually um, uh, an, a, 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 a pig like a protein substrate, particularly this copper complex, which was going into the lysosomes. It was really uh, a very, very nice substrate, being much better than standard uh, substrates of pig like protein, such as verapamil. So this was really interesting. It told us, it gave us some suggestion that pig like protein could transport our drug. But it didn't help us very much because if this is the case that our drug is being transported by pig like protein, and if the case is that pig like protein is only present on the cell membrane, what would happen is our drug would come into the cell and then it would be pumped out very, very quickly, which would prevent its activity. Now, we were seeing the absolute opposite. Our drug was coming into the cell and pig like protein was somehow increasing not decrease, it was increase the activity of our drug. And so we thought, well, this is, there's something else going on here which we quite don't understand. Classically, if you go to the textbooks and you look at pig like a protein, what you'll see in the textbooks is a, a cell which is uh, uh, illustrated like a, like a bubble. Uh, and what you'll see is the pig like a protein sitting on the cell surface and the pig like a protein pumping out. Now, cells aren't bubbles. They're alive, they're, they're, they're working, they're metabolically active. They endocytose their plasma membrane. Now, what happens when a pig like a protein is endocytose? Well, you can see what happens when it's on the cell surface, it's pumping out. But when you get the endocytosis, the internalization of the pig like a protein into the cell, you can see what happens. There's a revectorization of the pumping. So it's not, a, it's not pumping out now, it's actually pumping in when you get the formation of an endosome. Now, some of these endosomes can mature into lysosomes. And if this process continues as pumping in, what we're going to get is pig like protein substrates, such as our drug, being pumped into the lysosome. And as I told you before, the lysosome is one of the key targets of our drugs. Our drugs love the lysosome. So if our drugs could be pumped more effectively into the lysosome, then we would get much better anti-cancer activity. And this would explain our observation that P-glycoprotein was acting to enhance the activity of our drug and kill these very highly resistant cancer cells expressing very, very high levels of the P-glycoprotein. So we started to think, okay, can we prove that pig like a protein is not only present on the cell surface, but can be actually seen inside the cells and endosomes, and more particularly in the lysosomes. And so we started to look at this. We started to see where the pig like a protein was in the cell. And again, we went back to this technique of using the confocal microscope. And uh, what we can see here are studies done uh, with cells expressing high levels of pig like a protein. And we're looking at the expression of the pig like a protein in the cell. So you can see the pig like a protein here under the microscope. You can see the pig like a protein is present beautifully on the cell surface. You can see it here, uh, beautifully expressed on the cell membrane. But if you look very closely at this image, you can actually see these little baby dots within the, within the cell. And they look somewhat similar to lysosomes. So we started to think, well, could this be the pig like a protein in lysosomes? And you can actually stain the lysosomes very nicely using a marker called LAMP2. They use an antibody to detect the LAMP2, which is a lysosomal protein. And so when we did this and we looked at whether the pig like a protein was actually present within the lysosomes, it's just like mixing paints, as I said before, with confocal microscopy. Uh, red, red and green gives yellow. And so what this told us was that the pig like a protein was not only present on the cell membrane, but it was actually present in the cell and in the lysosomes. And this was quite interesting. We then confirmed these uh, studies, which were done using confocal microscopy using centrifugation. And again, it demonstrated the pig like a protein in the lysosomes. We looked at the nucleus as well with confocal microscopy. Again, there was no colocalization with the nucleus. We also looked at mitochondria and looked at the co-localization of pig-like protein with mitochondria, and there was none. 
the big correlation between pig lycoprotein and uh, the lysosome was really very, very marked in these cells. So this suggested that what we had was not only pig lycoprotein on the cell surface, but also pig lycoprotein present within the lysosome. Now, if you think about it, that, that's, that's quite interesting, um, but it could also be interpreted from a point of view that, well, you know, lysosomes are the garbage men of the cells. Perhaps your observation that the pig lycoprotein in the lysosomes is just, can be explained quite simply by the fact that the lysosomes are breaking down the pig lycoprotein. And so you see it in the lysosomes uh, being co-localized within the lysosomal fraction because they're just breaking down the pig lycoprotein. So we needed an assay to demonstrate that these pumps, these pig lycoprotein pumps were still active and were still bringing in pig lycoprotein substrate. So that was the next step. We wanted to test whether these pumps present on the lysosome were actually active. So again, we went back to the microscope. Again, we looked at doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is this PGP substrate, which can be transported by the pig lycoprotein. And we looked at cells uh, highly expressing pig lycoprotein, and we compared them to cells which didn't have any pig lycoprotein. And so we've added to these cells the doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is a big conjugated molecule, um, and uh, it's actually uh, inherently fluorescent. You can see it down the uh, fluorescent microscope. It's bright red. And so what we can see here are the cells beautifully labeled with the doxorubicin. When we look at the co-localization between doxorubicin and the lysosomes using the lamp to stain, red and green gives yellow. So what we have here is doxorubicin in the lysosome. So indeed, the doxorubicin seems to be transported into lysosomes in the presence of pig lycoprotein. But importantly, if we block that pig lycoprotein with a lacridar, prevent it from working with the inhibitor of pig lycoprotein, we see a big change in the doxorubicin. No longer is the doxorubicin out in the cytosol, out with the, the lysosomes. We can see a big change when we add lacridar. The doxorubicin goes to the nucleus. And so you can see the doxorubicin changes its distribution, it's now in the nucleus. So the red of the doxorubicin with the blue of the DAPI stain, it's a nuclear stain, red and blue gives purple. So what's happened here is we've blocked that pig lycoprotein uh, transporter using the alacridar and the doxorubicin has then gone to its natural target, the nucleus uh, in these cells, which are hyper expressing the pig lycoprotein. Now, if we look at cells that don't have any pig lycoprotein, the doxorubicin just goes straight to the nucleus. It doesn't even bother about the, the lysosome. Uh, it actually just goes straight to the nucleus where it actually intercalates into the DNA. So what we have here is a demonstration that this pump on the lysosome is actually functional. It can pump substrates into the lysosomal compartment. So we then thought, okay, well, this is interesting. We know our drug loves the lysosomes. So could this be important in terms of the action of our drug? And so we decided to look at this. And so we took the cells and we, we, we labeled them up again with the lyser tracker. So you can see all of the lysosomes, beautifully stained orange here with the lyser tracker. If we then add our compound, our compound is rapidly taken up into the lysosomes. It destroys the lysosomes very quick. So you can see the loss of all of the lysosomes. But if we take those cells and we add lacridar, if we block the action of that pump using lacridar, we prevent the drug from coming into the lysosome. We prevent the damage to the lysosome. So we have all happy lysosomes here after we treat with lacridar. So what this is saying is that this pump this pig lycoprotein -like pump, which is responsible for resistance, is facilitating the action of our drug getting into the lysosome, where it works very nicely to bind the copper, the damage the lysosomal membrane, and kill these highly resistant cancer cells. So this is in vitro. This is all in cells and culture. We wondered, can we do a clever experiment in animals, in mice, to look at whether uh, this mechanism is actually occurring in vivo in an animal. And so what we did, we took uh, the little nude mice again, and this time 
we've injected them with the tumors. So we did two tumors. The tumor with the P-glycoprotein, the KBB1 cells, uh, was placed uh, on the left-hand flank. The tumors without the P-glycoprotein were placed on the right-hand flank. So what you have is one little baby mouse, two tumors with and without P-glycoprotein. We allowed those tumors to grow, so you have primary tumor masses on the animal, and then we begin injection into the tail vein for nine days. And then we looked at the growth of the tumors uh, in these animals. And what we can see here is that if we looked at the tumors, which don't have any P-glycoprotein, uh, after treatment of the animals, you can see some effect here. There is a reduction in the growth of the tumor relative to the vehicle, but it's not very marked. The big story here is that when we looked at the tumors expressing the P-glycoprotein, you can see a very nice decrease in the growth of these P-glycoprotein expressing tumors. So not only in vitro, but also in vivo, we get this effect of the P-glycoprotein actually enhancing the uptake of the drug into the lysosome. And this is where the drug likes to get to kill the cancer cells. So we have very, very resistant cancer cells now being susceptible to the action of our drug, which we think is really very, very important. So by understanding the mechanisms of how these drugs work is very important in terms of potentially also developing even better drugs to actually result in better treatment for the patients. So I'd just like to thank everyone involved with this work, which is a, a work which has been undergone, uh, been under, undergoing, and still remains going in my laboratory over the last uh, 25 years or more. And I'd just like to thank everyone involved in my laboratory, including Jurai, who was one of my very good postdocs. And I'd just like to also thank the, um, uh, the funding agencies here in Australia. So again, thank you very much, Jurai, for your very kind invitation today. I hope the, the talk may be of interest uh, to the people out there. Thank you. Thank you, Des. After a long time, I could hear a comprehensive presentation. Can we allow our audience to ask some questions to clarify their doubts? Uh, audiences, uh, if you have some queries, you can raise, you can unmute yourself and uh, Ask the speaker. Hello. Yes. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. You can. Yes, you are audible. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Yes. Such a elaborative talk. And uh, we started with a single molecule way back in 15 years, uh, maybe 20 years. So we don't understand biology sometimes, but the publications we understood with a simple single molecule, uh, no, it gave you so many publications, that's one. And a lot of biology, maybe it might be happening with a lot of collaborations, we all agree. Now my observations are maybe not my question, my observation is, I would like to know what is the fate of that molecule now, the clinical trials are many or, uh, or maybe it's going to be when it's going to be marketed as a drug. And my yes. second uh, uh, query or question is like uh, my second query is let me finish please. And uh, that uh, no the people like us in India uh, no with a meager funding. What is the difficulties or maybe challenges you want to submit someone want to take care of this kind of research? So what you would like to advise? Oh, okay. So they're very good questions. So the first question is um, regarding the, the clinical trial of this compound, DPC. The clinical trial obviously went forward and the compound demonstrated uh, very good pharmacokinetics and also demonstrated um, uh, its abilities to be absorbed from the gut, which was also very, very important. Um, it did show some uh, slight effect in terms of muscle pain. Um, the patients uh, had muscle pain after the treatment with this particular drug, which actually has stopped the trial. Now, as you know, many different anti-cancer drugs have huge effects, uh, huge um, side effects. 
This is one particular side effect with this particular drug. And what we've done now, we believe we understand what was happening with this particular side effect. And we've been able to develop another drug, which I didn't talk about today, which actually uh, prevents this particular problem. So we are now actively um, looking for um, partners, pharmaceutical partners to actually take this new drug into a second clinical trial to demonstrate how effective uh, the compounds uh, are in humans. So this is a really very, very important. So we have uh, one particular company already um, online in terms of trying to take this compound. So um, hopefully over the next couple of years, we should have more details regarding uh, this next third generation of compounds. So this is the third generation of these agents which we've been developing over the last 24 years. So it's a very, very long and tedious process, um, but we believe that we're onto a very interesting um, molecule, which has a very unique mechanism of action. So basically, I'm still very much heartened in terms of what we're actually doing. Um, there are no other drugs available at the moment which can actually specifically block metastasis, which can specifically at the same time block P-glycoprotein mediated resistance. And on top of that, can actually block primary tumor growth very, very well at all as well. So I still think that these compounds are really very, very exciting. And that's why we're continuing to work on them. In terms of the troubles of uh, funding, yes, it's always a trouble to get funding. Uh, it's very, it's not only hard in India, I think it's hard everywhere. It's certainly hard in Australia. Um, and, you know, I guess it's important, you know, to make sure that you apply for as many different kinds of grants as you possibly can and obtain not only support from the, the governments and, and various organizations, but also pharmaceutical companies to try and, you know, gain extra. Um, gain extra financial uh, support to be able to get your compounds uh, into clinical trials because that's absolutely critical. Thank you very much, Professor Bless. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions? Uh, hello, uh, am I audible, uh, Professor yes, Bless? Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Des, nice, uh, you know, complete story we can see. And uh, actually, it is highly motivating. Uh, it is from almost from 2004. You are working on this uh, project. And uh, very, very congratulations for really getting a, you know, very potent uh, lead compound. I have only, you know, I uh, have only two maybe uh, very silly questions. So one question I would like to ask that as a researcher or as a scientist, uh, what limitation you think of your drug right now, which you have sent for the clinical trial? You know, because when we highlight many things, we also know that where it can really face the trouble. So that is one question. And second is uh, whether the same mechanism which you have proposed uh, in terms of in the lysosome, uh, whether the same mechanism is not operational in terms of normal cells. So where it will trigger the generation of the charged species as a radical, and it may also lead to, you know, quick apoptosis, which may lead to further radical generation and generating the new tumors. So it may be a little silly in that sense, but whether it is possible. So if you can elaborate on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your for your uh, for your comments. That's uh, the good questions. Um, so you know, in terms of uh, designing a compound, these compounds have gone through many many different um, uh, many many different rounds of, of design, as Durai knows. Um, so we're up to our third generation of compounds, and you're always uh, looking to make the compound selective and specific, and obviously. Um, it's very, very difficult to, to be able to do that. Um, so these compounds demonstrate very marked uh, selectivity um, and demonstrated very marked selectivity, not only in vitro, but also in vivo as well. When we came to the humans, that was a bit of a surprise. And um, 
again, it was it's a learning experience uh, to be able to um, take away from that, uh, inf take away from those particular results in humans and then try and redesign the compounds again to even improve them over what you had previously. So there is, you know, successive generations, there's successive building and it's a building process and it's a learning process, but it's a, a very, very slow process, which takes a very, very long time. So this work actually uh, didn't start in 2004. I showed you data from 2004. It actually started well, well before that, back in uh, oh, okay. 1994, in fact. So it actually, and even well before that, it actually goes back to 1984 when I actually began as a graduate student. So um, it's been a very long development process. It's not something which I've done you know, uh, over the last couple of weeks, it's, it's, it's a very considered, um, a very, very considered and very unique set of compounds with a very unique targets, which no one has been able to uh, look at previously. There'd been no studies done to try and understand the structure activity relationships of compounds that bind iron and copper and to design compounds, specifically design them to be able to go into the cancer cells, bind iron and copper, and then selectively inhibit the cancer cells. So that's basically what I've been trying to do over all these years. So that's kind of my contribution to, the, to this area of, of research. Um, in terms of the selectivity with the lysosomal story, they are very, very um, selective. They demonstrate this in vitro in cell culture. You get very good activity against the cancer cells and very low activity in the normal cells. And same thing in the animals. And we think it's probably got to do with the differences in the metabolism of the lysosome uh, between the cancer cells and the normal cells. The cancer cells, the lysosomes are extremely active and they're, they're, they're very active because the cancer cell is very active. So the lysosome becomes a really critical target. The process of autophagy within the lysosome is critical for the life of the cancer cell. Cancer cells require very active autophagy to maintain such active metabolism. So the fact that we're able to hit the lysosomes is actually very, very beneficial and it's, it's acting quite selectively, not only in vitro, but also in vivo too. So it's, it's, it's again, very, very surprising, but very interesting on the other hand as well. And, and obviously we think it's a, a really important aspect of the way these compounds work. Thank you, Des. As we are running out of time, we will limit questions with this. Uh, now I would like to propose a word of thanks on behalf of a distinguished lecture committee. Uh, I have to thank Professor Des for accepting my invitation to deliver a talk on the cancer. It, it was about uh, one o'clock at night. So I sent an email. In another 10 minutes, Des has replied that, yes, I can deliver a talk. And uh, of course, uh, I couldn't reply back because I have to get a date from Vice Chancellor and the register. And uh, Des asked me again, Durai, did, did you get my email? Can you reply? Okay. So he is so quick in replying emails. He is so active. For example, recently I deleted almost all emails which I received from University of Sydney. It was about 7,000 emails, out of which more than 2,000 emails had a conversation between me and Des. Most of the days he used to send emails and little sluggish to reply. But what I mean is he's so active in replying, so active in research. Okay. And even my postdoctoral studies, we can conduct them at any time of 24 into 7. When you get some crazy ideas at like 1 o'clock, you will send an email. Do I can we synthesize <laughs> such compounds? <laughs> so such a such a very such active, a crazy yeah, such a crazy, crazy man. Crazy active. Of course, science requires crazy activity. <laughs> that's right, Jerome. Okay. That's that's and exactly right. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful talk. So I also would like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Halagawadi, to deliver an address, and also Professor 
donor, registrar of our university, uh, accepting our invitation to Delhi, I mean, to organize this talk under the banner of Distinguished Lecture Series. And I must thank the Distinguished Lecture Series Committee. In fact, they worked on the background. They have given a lot of inputs and they also worked in the logistics okay, to make this seminar successful. Especially Professor Vikram and Dr. Raju, Dr. Kiran, Dr. Mangalam, and also Ms. Ankita. So thank you all for your support through this committee. And thank you all audience to joining for this meeting and hope it will be useful for you, those who are working particularly on the cancer. Okay, stay safe. Okay. Because during this all right. Time, so thank you very much, Jurai. And thank you for everyone for, for listening. Bye-bye. So, yes, Stay safe. Thank you, sir. Stay safe. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, sir. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, sir.